Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to CE Elevated, a CSU Vet CE webinar series. I'm your host, Dr. Ross Palmer from Colorado State University, and I'd like to thank you for joining us on behalf of CSU Vet CE here at the Translational Medicine Institute. We've named this webinar series CE Elevated, symbolic of our Colorado mountainous terrain, as well as our mission to provide you with an elevated CE experience in all that we do. We honestly believe there's great power in the collision between inspired learners, that's you guys, engaged educators, that's our guests this evening, and meaningful experiences. Tonight, we're sincerely thankful for the support of both Universal Imaging and Merck Animal Health, who have made this webinar episode possible. Tonight, we're joined by a special guest and my friend and colleague, Dr. Pat McHugh, and he's gonna be speaking on equine embryo transfer. Pat has an entire online course on this topic and others available at csuvetce.com, and I'm sure that his presentation this evening is likely to wet your palate for that. Uh, Dr. Pat McHugh received his DVM from UC Davis. He completed an internship in large animal medicine and surgery at the University of Pennsylvania and a residency in equine repro at UC Davis. He became a diplomat of the American College of Theriogenologists in 1991, just a few years ago at this point, and received his PhD in comparative pathology with an emphasis on repro endocrinology and ovarian pathology in the mare. That was from UC Davis in 1992. Dr. McHugh joined the faculty here at CSU in 1994, where he's currently the Iron Rose Ranch Professor of Equine Theriot. Dr. McHugh coordinates the clinical stallion and mare services at the Equine Reproduction Laboratory, and he attends dystocias, high-risk pregnancies, and other equine repro cases at the Veterinary Teaching Hospital. He is the author or co-author of 10 books or e-books and over 400 refereed publications, textbook chapters, scientific proceedings, and or abstracts. Dr. McHugh received the Norden Distinguished Teaching Award and the AAEP Teaching Award from the veterinary students here at Colorado State University, and those are high honors. In addition, he received the 2017 Theriogenologist of the Year Award from the American College of Theriogenologists for his outstanding accomplishments in the field. And he also received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the European Symposium on Equine Reproduction in 2022. So Pat, that's a long list of great honors. We're honored to have you here this evening. I turn the program over to you, my friend. Thanks, Ross. That's longer than my seminar. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be quizzes on it afterwards. All right. All right. So I'm going to share the screen. So what Looks this topic great. is going to be is, is uh, obviously equine embryo transfer. And the goal of this, um, make sure I can advance this. The goal of, of the webinar is going to, we're going to do an overview of embryo transfer in the mare. And then we're going to divide up the, the program into about 15 to 20 minute segments. One is going to be on the donor mare and the collection of embryos. And the other one is going to be on the recipient mare and the transfer of embryos. Try to move along here. Okay, and just for fun, the let people know the first embryo transfer that's been reported was in 1890. Sir Walter Heap did uh, embryo transfer between rabbits. And, and uh, to my knowledge, that's the first one ever uh, done in any uh, mammalian species. If we move to the, to the horse, the milestones or, or, or critical uh, events in equine embryo transfer, the fo first foal produced by embryo transfer was born in 1974. Uh, frozen embryos in the horse. The first foal born was in 1982, in vitro fertilization, and that the frozen one was in um, uh, in Japan. The in vitro fertilization 1991 in France, and then the first foal born from intracytoplasmic sperm injection 1996 uh, here at Colorado State, as was the first foal born from vitrified oocytes or eggs. And that was reported in 2002, also at Colorado State.
We're going to move to why do we perform embryo transfer in mares? And those of you that do embryo transfer will recognize a list like this. You may have one or two others to put on the list, but this is the common ones that we have. Uh, performance mares, horses that are are, are in active training or performance, no matter what their discipline, whether they're warm bloods or quarter horses or whatever, they can take a, a small time out to be bred and then about a week later have an embryo recovery attempt and they don't lose much time off and they can say in training or in performance, they don't have to carry the foal to term. A surrogate mare or recipient mare can do that. We see a lot of subfertile mares and often they're mares that are older, may have some reproductive problems, and if we can um, get them pregnant to the point of having an embryo in their uterus, we can obviously flush the embryo out and transfer it into a recipient mare and they don't have to carry. The photograph on the right shows a more dramatic medical issue. This mare had a prosthetic device and this mare had been, been uh, wearing this for, for more than two years. She came to our program and we were able to get three embryos out of this mare and three pregnancies, uh, one of those reabsorbed, but uh, two live foals were born. And for a mare like this is more dramatic, but mares with musculoskeletal issues, laminitis, one example, uh, that shouldn't be allowed to carry a foal to term, we can transfer embryos into a recipient mare and have that mare have a, a healthier uh, time period. Mares that fall out late in the season, we might not think about this one so much, and that would be a mare that foals out in, say, May or early June, and the owner doesn't want to breed the mare back to carry again because she may just uh, end up uh, um, foaling again late in the year. We can do one embryo cycle or two and then leave the donor mare open. They can put her under lights and start the breeding season early again the following year. And then more obvious one, it's the only way to obtain more than one foal per mare per year, either embryo transfer or, or ICSI, but with the transfer of embryos. And often we'll get mares in as donor mares with the idea that they want more than one pregnancy and often want more than one stallion to be involved. Okay, we're gonna start with the donor mare. And these are just gonna be uh, brief comments on the donor and then on the recipient. As Dr. Palmer said, we've got a whole course, eight lectures dedicated to equine embryo transfer in all its aspects. For the donor mare management, the, the actual reproductive management is very similar to that if we're going to breed a mare to carry with either fresh or cooled or frozen semen. When we talk about selecting the day to flush the mare, if we want to cryopreserve an embryo, we would either flush the mare on day six and a half or very early in the morning of day seven before the embryo starts to expand. The equine embryo enters the uterus either late on day five or very early on day six. So we really can't get the embryo uh, before that, at least not out of the uterus. So we have to wait till at least late on day six to, to flush a mare. And we'd get either a morula or a very early blastocyst stage embryo. The equine embryo starts to expand on day seven. So between the morning of day seven and the afternoon of day seven, that embryo will, will get a, a lot bigger. And then day eight, uh, we will we'll flush in the morning. I put an asterisk by this. I get a pointer on here. Whoops. And um, so the morning of day eight is when we typically do our, our embryo collections. And we can see the difference here between in, in this embryo that we flushed out of a mare, a pair here, a day seven embryo and a day eight embryo. They were asynchronous ovulations. Uh, this is just a normal expanded blastocyst and a morula stage embryo, maybe developing an early blastocele cavity here, a thick zona pellucida on the outside of this one. So if we look at the embryo size and re related to the day of flush, on day six, the embryo diameter average is a little under 200 microns. By day seven, it's about 350 microns on average. There's quite a bit of variability in that. And day eight, they can be dramatically expanded anywhere from uh, three to 400 microns up to greater than, um, greater than a millimeter. So again, rapid expansion beginning on the afternoon of day seven. Then the standard equipment um, and how, how we do this, we would use a, a catheter, maybe a silastic catheter with a balloon cuff. Uh, there'd be sterile Y tubing that would, that would come up in and join onto the catheter. Uh, I can't even see my little, uh, I have to move this. The, uh, the syringe would be uh, attached here that would inflate that cuff. 
the Y tubing would be connected to a fluid bag with media. And then the other part of the Y tubing would come down here and go through some type of a filter cup. There's a variety of these filters. And, and this one has a filter on the bottom. We use a graduated cylinder down below to collect the fluid, the effluent fluid. If we know we put a liter in, expand the uterus and drain that back out, we expect to get most of a liter back out. And this is a way we can uh, gauge how much fluid is being left in the mare's uterus. The kind of media that we have for options, a uh, long time ago, we made our own media, but you can use lactated ringers. You can add a surfactant like polyvinyl alcohol to lactated ringers. Hartman's solution is very similar to lactated ringers. That's what we're currently using uh, with polyvinyl alcohol to prevent the embryo from adhering really to the plastic part of the Petri dish when we go to search for the embryo. Or you can use a complete flush media, and we did that for many, many years, uh, and that's quite effective as well. So uh, a, a couple... Um, uh, a couple ways that embryo recovery is, is done. It depends on the veterinarian doing the flushing and, and the various programs out there. One common way is to uh, flush the mare multiple times in sequence. And what I really mean by that is put about a liter or so, could be a little less, could be a little more, up in the uterus, drain that back out, repeat that a second time, drain it back out through the filter, and then repeat it maybe a third time. And then once that sequence of three flushes is done, then go into the lab, pour the contents of the, uh, the filter cup out into a Petri dish and look under a microscope for the embryo. And that in our world is a fairly efficient way to do it. Others do it a little bit differently and they may uh, flush the mare once with a liter or a little more of fluid, then go into the laboratory and look for the embryo. If they find it, they're done. If not, they come back out and flush it again. In, in the in our particular um, environment, flushing the mare three times in a row seems to be the most efficient way. What we'll do is if we get the embryo, uh, then we're done. If there were two embryos, if the mare double ovulated, I should say, uh, if we get one embryo, we're going to go try to get the second embryo as well. Or if we did not get the first embryo, we'll have left the catheter in place after our first round of flushing. If we don't get the embryo, we're going to put more fluid in the mare, and, and we'll see this data in just a minute, and then um, I'll see if we recover the embryo, and we may do it yet one more time. And so we'll see that data in a minute. I'll explain a little better in a couple of moments. And that does increase our, our overall embryo recovery. We have, on occasion, reflushed the mare the following day. The embryo recovery rate is not very high with that. Sometimes it's a very important embryo and you've had one shot at it uh, and you, you may not want to give up or the owner may pressure you to, to keep trying. And so once in a while, we'll flush the mare again the next day. Again, embryo recovery rate's low and there's usually um, a debris in the effluent fluid. So here's some data uh, on, a, on a group of 77 mares that we flushed. In the first round, three flushes, and we use about a total of a little over three liters to put a liter in, a little more, drain that back out, do that three times in a row. And in this particular data set, we had 43 embryos that we recovered from those 77 mares for a 55% embryo recovery rate. In the ones that we did not get, that'd be uh, 34 mares, we uh, still had the catheter in the mare, so we put another batch of fluid in there, the last of it in that five liter bag of Hartman solution, and we got another four embryos. And if you're the owner of those four embryos, that's an important uh, recovery. In the mares that we still did not get an embryo from, we hung another five liter bag of Hartman solution with PVA and got yet another five embryos out. So when we added up all the embryos, it increased our overall embryo recovery rate from 55% to uh, 68%. So again, uh, attention to detail and being persistent about trying to get the embryo out is helpful. Now, our program is not as large as some of the programs around the U.S. or around the world. I clearly know that. Uh, and uh, we're able to spend a little more time on the individual mare to try to optimize embryo recovery rate. In bigger practices, you may not be able to do that. 
So the embryos that we get out would typically be either a morula. That'd be unusual for, for us to flush a morula out on a day flush. It happens sometimes. This is a morula sage embryo. We've seen this before. You can see uh, individual blastomeres here and a thick zone of pellucida around the outside. Early blastocyst stage embryo, that's this one. We, we have a blastocyl cavity and inner cell mass. And there's actually two layers on the outside, a zone of pellucida and a capsule developing underneath the zone of pellucida outside of the trophoblast layer. This is a blastocyst stage. We can see the inner cell mass and trophoblast cells in this otherwise hollow fluid-filled sphere. And this is uh, an expanded blastocyst. It looks the same size, but with magnification and just a different uh, a microscope lens, it, it looks the same size, but this is about two or three times as big as that other one to its left. Once in a while, we'll get an unfertilized egg, an unfertilized oocyte, and this is a, a single cell, um, and, and it's got cytoplasm here in a very thick zone of pellucida. Most of the time, they're either round or oval like this uh, when viewed from above. Three-dimensionally, they're flat, they're not spherical, and, and they do not roll when you ma uh, manipulate it in a Petri dish. And that's really a good way to tell the difference between uh, an unfertilized egg and a morula stage uh, embryo. Uh, this is three-dimensionally somewhat spherical, and you can make it roll across the bottom of a Petri dish. This is flat, and it'll be flat like a pancake or a Frisbee. You can make it go up on edge, and it'll fall back down again. Critical that you understand the, the difference between an unfertilized oocyte and a morula stage embryo. Some of the issues that we encounter uh, in, in the embryo transfer world, older maiden mares, and often these are mares in their mid-teens or older uh, that are going to be uh, bred for the first time uh, to either carry their own pregnancy or for embryo transfer. The issue really is the cervix. And probably about 50% of these mares have a cervix that does not relax like it should during estrus. And, and when we go to breed this mare, we can usually tell if it's going to be problematic from a reproductive management and an embryo recovery standpoint. And we can see that in this center uh, photograph here, we've got a cervix, uh, the dorsal frenulum, and there's another frenulum down at the bottom. If this never relaxes, it, number one, it'll be difficult to pass an insemination pipette up here to breed the mare. And it'll also be challenging to put a catheter up in for embryo recovery. But the biggest issue is that this mare will not be able to expel the fluid that occurs at the time of breeding and the inflammatory fluid that will be present in her uterus following breeding. There are some things you can do, um, a uterine lavage later in the day that you bred the mare, probably with oxytocin during the lavage to stimulate uterine contractions. We can apply prostaglandin E1, mesoprostol, uh, to the cervix. Buscapan can be used, manual dilation of the cervix, but they're not as easy, these mares that are, that are in their mid to late teens uh, from an embryo recovery standpoint. We also see that cervical issue on mares that are used in an embryo transfer program, but have never carried a foal to term. And by the time they get into their mid-teenage years, they may also have cervical problems and retention of fluid uh, after breeding. Another topic that we should consider is, is what to do after a routine flush. Even if you recover an embryo, uh, a standard uh, a procedure is to administer a dose of prostaglandins to that mare. And that will obviously cause luteolysis, destruction of the corpus luteum. That mare will have an opportunity to come back into estrus within the next few days. The prostaglandins will stimulate uterine contractions. She'll expel any residual fluid that you may have left in there. But critically important, it prevents any unwanted pregnancy from continuing. The photograph on the lower right here shows uh, she's an embryo donor mare. And uh, this mare was inseminated in our program. And, and eight days later, an embryo collection attempt was performed. And we got an unfertilized egg out of this mare. And a majority of the time, if there's an unfertilized egg that we do recover in the effluent fluid coming out of the uterus, there's an embryo somewhere. And the equine embryo makes prostaglandin E2 to facilitate its own transit down the distal part of the oviduct through the isthmus and the uterotubular junction, and then pass into the uterine lumen. 
And so uh, unfertilized oocytes do not make prostaglandin E2, and they're generally retained in the oviduct. And so knowing that there was a, an unfertilized egg in the, um, in the Petri dish, we knew that there was an embryo up in that mare somehow. Uh, so we re reflushed the mare. We put a total of 10 liters of fluid through that mare, still did not get an embryo. Uh, we called the owner and said, you've got a couple options here. We can give prostaglandins to the mare and be done with the cycle. We can flush the mare again tomorrow uh, and see if we can get an embryo then, or we can just do a pregnancy exam in about seven days and see if that mare was, was pregnant. And the owner elected, interestingly, to let's just see what happens. So a week later, we did an ultrasound exam and, and saw a nice embryonic vesicle, 14, 15 day embryonic vesicle. And she chose to leave that mare pregnant and let her carry to term. And so this, again, I, this has happened to a number of people over many, many years. This mare gave birth to a normal, healthy foal. Uh, she was not administered prostaglandins, in this case, on purpose. And the point is, you can do an embryo recovery attempt, put multiple uh, liters of fluid in and out of a uterus, and that mare can still remain pregnant. Exactly where that embryo was, uh, we don't know. If it was tucked under an endometrial fold or if it was still up in the oviduct, uh, would be no way to know. Another issue with embryo donors to just uh, talk about briefly is some of these older mares that are challenging to flush and you get poor fluid recovery. And the issue really is that on these older mares that have had multiple folds before, the uterus is draped over the pelvis and, and down further ventrally in the abdomen. So one of the, the issues is if you put an embryo recovery catheter up in the silastic catheter, up in the mare's uterine body, inflate the cuff, snug it back against the internal os of the cervix. If you put fluid in her uterus, and try to get that fluid back out, you're expecting that fluid to run uphill and then go caudally and, until, uh, until it gets to the catheter. And sometimes the mares just don't do that, even with oxytocin causing uterine contraction, that just doesn't work. So one technique, you can, um, you can put fluid down in the uterus, then deflate the cuff on the catheter. So this is the end of, of this bivona type silastic catheter. This is the very tip of the catheter. This is where the cuff was. The cuff has been deflated. You can, you can tell there's still a shadow coming down in there, but that was where the cuff was. Deflate the cuff, start putting more fluid in, and as this fluid goes in, it's going to create a pathway uh, through that uterine body, and you can advance the catheter in and down right into the deepest, most dependent part of the uterus. And then what we will do, and I challenge the residents in our program to do, then do a, a transrectal ultrasound procedure and you can see the fluid that's in her uterus. You can position the ultrasound probe down in that fluid with or without oxytocin, open up the outflow and you can aspirate that fluid back up again from the most de dependent part, the deepest part of the abdomen where that uterus is. And then, and then as the, the uterine horns are cleared, you can work the catheter caudally, just pulling it out gently until you recover all the fluid from both horns and the uterine body. So it's a technique we use routinely on older multiparous mares. Here's a photograph, another mare double ovulated. We got two embryos out of her and this very small, probably about 140, 150 micron uh, unfertilized oocyte. And, and if you, again, if you see one, you typically will have embryos either in the Petri dish or still up in the mare. So we'll, uh, we'll continue to flush that mare to try to recover the embryo that, that we know is, is um, high likelihood there's going to be one there. Again, embryos make prostaglandin E2 to facilitate their own transit down the distal oviduct. Unfertilized eggs do not, and they're retained in the oviduct. Once we get the embryo out, we're going to take a look at it to evaluate the embryo, both for its developmental stage and the quality of that embryo. And one needs to be able to dis distinguish between embryos of various quality levels, unfertilized oocytes and non-embryonic structures. And you can often, by gauging the, the quality of the embryo, have an idea of, of, number one, can you freeze that embryo? Number two, uh, what, what is the, the likelihood of success after transfer? So we've got a drawing up here of a blastocyst stage embryo. We've got the blastocyst cavity in the center. 
a single layer in this drawing of trophoblast cells, the inner cell mass. And then in yellow, we've got the, the unique capsule that equine embryos make. And then we've got out, outside of here, the trophoblast cells, and then the outer zona pellucida. And so uh, two non-cellular investments uh, protecting the embryo, the capsule, and the zona pellucida. Now the zona is gonna shed as that embryo expands. The embryo will enlarge, the zona will get thinner, and the zona will gently um, be sloughed off of that. The photograph on the bottom, the, the zona's a, a little, um, uh, has come, has started to peel away from, from the embryo. We've got, the, again, the zona on the outside. We've got the capsule here, this white structure, trophoblast cells, perivitellin space, a space in between the trophoblast and either the zona or the capsule, blastocele cavity. There's no clear view of the inner cell mass in that particular embryo. So I'm going to pause there for a moment. And Dr. Palmer, do you um, are there any questions that anybody has typed in so far? Yeah, there are some great questions here, Pat. And um, again, I want to. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I just want to remind everybody we we are grateful to Universal Imaging and Merck Animal Health uh, not only for sponsoring the webinar but this Q and A session. Uh, so the first question is, when breeding with frozen semen, which is the best day to flush an embryo? Yeah, it's a little bit of a loaded question. Uh, we've got some data that would suggest that that embryo development is, is very slightly delayed if we breed mares with frozen semen. And so back when we were uh, flushing mares on the afternoon of day seven, if we had uh, bred that mare with frozen semen, we would have waited another half a day until the morning of day eight. Now we, uh, now we flush all mares on the morning of day eight, so it doesn't matter so much. There's other data, uh, Utrecht published a study where they didn't have much of a difference between embryo development with frozen semen and embryo um, that, that were created with either fresh or cooled semen. And so you know, the data is a little bit different. I trust their data, I trust our data. One thing about breeding with frozen embryos, the data is a little cleaner in that we, we often are ultrasounding those mares about every six hours, and we, we know a, a closer time for when they ovulate. When we breed mares with fresh or cooled semen, we're often doing that just once a day, so the data is not as tight. But, but, but our world right now, we're flushing all mares on the morning of day eight. All righty. Um, and would uh, another question from the audience is, would you worry about cleaning and transferring the embryo on day eight with the increased size? It's a good question. We wash every embryo, and um, what we do is use embryo holding media, commercial embryo holding media, and, and we'll typically wash it in four, uh, four droplets and wash it in between uh, those four droplets, changing the quarter mil straw in between all of those. Uh, some people will wash it in as many as 10 droplets. Uh, the consideration is that you're almost treating the, the the donor mare, like she might have a, an issue in her uterus, or maybe there's some bacteria that was associated with a flush process. You're trying to get that embryo cleaner and cleaner and cleaner before you transfer it into a recipient mare that's in mid diastra So most people will wash the embryo and, and do it through multiple steps. And so a day eight embryo, uh, the morning of day eight, they typically, typically will fit in a quarter mil straw. Uh, but if you wait until the afternoon, uh, you may have to use a half mil straw because the embryo will be physically too big to get it into a quarter mil straw. And, and we've had some embryos that have surprised us and been large enough that they don't fit in a half mil straw. And we've had to take an insemination pipette, cut it down a little bit and use an insemination pipette with its bigger lumen to wash some of these larger embryos that may, may approach even two millimeters in size. We look back at that and go, did we really know the time that that mare ovulated? And probably not accurately enough. Um, yeah, got a few more questions coming in. How often do you add PVA to Hartman's solution for embryo flush? We uh, did a, a small clinical trial. When we moved to uh, away from complete holding a uh, complete flush media, which we use for decades, uh, to uh, to Hartman solution, which again is is very similar to lactate ringer, just a small difference in in potassium and maybe some other electrolytes, but it's essentially the same. Uh, we had some embryos that were adhering to the Petri dish, a plastic Petri dish. 
we changed petri dishes and they still adhered to it. And so when we added the surfactant, the PVA, polyvinyl alcohol, then we did not um, did not have any embryo stick after that. In the old days, we would have used fetal calf serum or newborn calf serum as the surfactant to keep embryos from sticking. There are people around the world that uh, do not have a, a problem with embryo sticking to the Petri dish. And I think it's probably the kind of plastic or how it's processed that, that some embryos are more adherent than others. Uh, we certainly have seen that. And so for us, uh, we add it all the time. And we'll add uh, 10 mils of a concentrated PVA solution to a five liter bag. Got a couple more for you here, Pat. Um, what day would you flush a mare if you want to vitrify an embryo from a mare that was bred with frozen semen? Would you flush day seven? Yeah, we would flush early in the morning at day seven. Our day starts pretty early anyway. And we'd probably be flushing that mare uh, between six and seven o'clock in the morning to try to get an embryo uh, out of her and and still be able to vitrify it before we start having to work our regular day job. Okay. And, uh, but so if you're gonna flush a mare to try to vitrify an embryo, I know I'm making a light of it here a little bit, but that embryo should be less than 300 microns in diameter. Anything over 300, the pregnancy rates after transfer uh, start to go down unless you do some embryo manipulation and maybe uh, maybe puncture the blastocele cavity and take out some of that fluid. That gets them a little more technical. So um, very early in the morning of day seven was is what is when we would do that. Good question. Yep, uh, there's a lot of good questions here. Then this last one, and then I'll let you go to your second session, but um, circles back to kind of one of our first questions, and that is, what is the recovery success rate with frozen semen? Right. There's a lot of factors that go into embryo recovery rate. A lot of it has to do with the health of the donor mare herself and both general health and reproductive health and, and that the age of the donor mare, quality of the semen, many, many factors. And so uh, we, we would generally say that if, if we put all mares together, all stallions together, if, if we're breeding with fresh semen, we might expect a 60 to 70 percent per cycle pregnancy rate and embryo recovery rate. With cooled semen, maybe about the same. For some stallions, it may be 5% lower. With frozen semen, it's gonna drop probably another 10 to 15%. So in general, there are some stallions that are highly fertile with frozen semen, but in general, we're going to expect that frozen semen is going to be significantly less pregnancy rate, uh, both uh, mares that are carrying their own pregnancy and embryo recovery than with fresh or cooled semen. Yeah, thanks, Pat. That's great information. Great questions, you guys. And uh, I think I'll turn it back over to you now, and then uh, we'll take some questions at the end of this session as well. Okay, we're going to move again. This is just an overview of embryo transfer, and we have a, a whole course, eight lectures on online at the TMI. Uh, those of you that want the, the more full picture of equine embryo transfer, we're going to move to management of the recipient herd. And you'll hear this said a lot, but recipient mares, they're the heart and soul of anybody's embryo transfer program. And you need quality recipients in order to have a successful program. In 2021 and 2022, one of the, the, the main challenges is trying to find them. Uh, the acquisition of them, the cost has gone way up in the last uh, year and a half. And their general availability, many programs ran out of recipient mares in the Northern Hemisphere, ran out of recipient mares by April or May. And they're just hard to find uh, good young mares. And another factor that's come into play is there's enough places doing intracytoplasm sperm injection or ICSI and doing that in the, in the spring, summer and fall and generating a number of, of embryos that are then cryopreserved and the owners wanna transfer those embryos early in the season. So it wouldn't be unusual for some of the larger embryo transfer programs to have a whole lot of embryos tra transferred within the first two or three weeks of the breeding season and taking a, quite a chunk out of your available uh, uh, recipient mares. So recipients are hard to get all over the world and, and they cost more than they ever have. So what do you want for a recipient mare? Ideally, well, when you start them, uh, a minimum, at least three years old, we probably would pick more four, four or five years old to start. And, and you probably wouldn't start acquiring a mare that was in her teenage years. You'd want a little 
younger than that because you want to be able to use this mare multiple times over the course of a reproductive life, lifetime. You'd like to match the, the recipients to the donor pool. If you're working with warm bloods, that would mean bigger recipient mares. If you're working with quarter horses or Arabians, uh, more moderately sized mares. Any owner and, and the veterinarian would want that mare to be gentle, certainly halter broke, easy to lead, easy to get along with, good body condition, not lame. Depending on how you acquire your a recipient, you may not know anything about uh, whether she's fertile or not. In anybody's embryo transfer program, there's always going to be mares that have had foals and always going to be mares that are maiden mares. And, and you really have no history and no known potential. Um, but a, a fact of life is, if a mare's flunked out of a breeding program, stated right here, if, if they can't get uh, bred in and get pregnant to carry, they're probably not going to make a good recipient mare. And so the reproductive status of, of mares, maiden, a mare that's never had a, really never been bred or never had a foal, an open mare, as I'm going to define it, it's a mare that was intentionally left open, a barren mare. I'm going to define that different than this one, and that would be a mare that's been bred maybe multiple times, did not get pregnant, and she's remained open through the winter, and then and then obviously a postpartum mare, a mare with, that currently has a foal at side. And I may briefly make a comment here: if we did have a recipient mare with a foal at side, I'd probably avoid the foal heat and put an embryo in her at the 30-day heat or or the one following that if we could. And so again. Recipient quality and having enough, the quantity of recipients are really critical to the success of your program. We uh, lease our recipients uh, from a vendor, and but uh, we've always had some owners bring us their own recipients, and that can be challenging in itself because you really don't have much of a history on those as well. Um, from a, from a, a recipient mayor to donor standpoint, uh, one guideline is to have, you need at least to have one, if not two recipients available for every donor mare. In the larger embryo transfer programs, there's generally a pool of recipients, sometimes big herds of recipients. And so the, the synchronization between any one given donor and any one given recipient is not quite as, as dramatic because there's often a two or three or more recipient mares available at, at some stage of the cycle. If you're working with one donor and one recipient mare, there's, there's clearly a synchronization protocols, not to belabor them here, but two doses of prostaglandin spread 14 days apart, a progesterone or altrinogest for 10 days with prostaglandins on the last day given to both the donor and the recipient, or for an even tighter synchronization, you can use a combination if you're allowed to. Uh, in Europe, you won't be able to do this. In the US, you can do this. I administer progesterone plus estradiol uh, for 10 days and prostaglandins on the last day. That'll give you a little tighter synchrony. If you're going to do these, uh, we would typically uh, give the recipient, start that therapy about two days after the donor mare. If anything, you want the, the recipient mare to be staggered uh, one or two days or three days behind the donor mare. And then when the recipient ovulates, then you have an opportunity to administer an ovulation induction agent to that recipient mare the day the donor mare ovulates. And whether it's HCG or GnRH agonists like Desloralin or Histralin, that recipient mare should ovulate some 36 to 40 hours after the donor mare ovulates. And that synchronization has been used for many, many years. So, in this little chart, it shows the synchrony, the working synchrony between donors and recipient. So at our program, we flush on day eight. Many programs uh, do the same thing. So the recipient mare could ovulate the day ahead, one day ahead of the donor mare. We would call that in our world a plus one. A day zero would be straight up the, uh, the donor mare and recipient mare ovulated the same day. A minus one, two, or three uh, the recipient mare ovulated one day after, two days after, out to even four days after the donor mare. So if we flush the mare on day eight, we typically would try to find a recipient mare that ovulated one or two days after. In any uh, uh, embryo transfer program that's got multiple donor mares, you need to pay attention to what's coming tomorrow and the next two or three days. You, want, you don't want to steal too far ahead because these mares will be needed 
from mares you're going to flush tomorrow, donor mares you're going to flush tomorrow or the next day. So we keep uh, all of this both manually and in a computer program uh, to line up donors and recipients. The transfer has been for decades uh, a non-surgical transfer, transcervical transfer. It takes minimal equipment. We'll talk about that in a moment and does require a little bit of, of experience and practice uh, to be proficient at it. I made a note down here from a historical standpoint in many species, embryo transfer was initially done with a surgical approach and in the horse early uh, ventral midline surgeries, or for many years, a standing flank approach was, was used to expose the uterine horn and then make a, a very tiny incision into the uterine horn and with a, a pipette, put the embryo down directly into the uterus. Uh, and now since the, since the, the 1980s, really, um, uh, non-surgical transfer has been uh, the, the most common. So the equipment is minimal. Uh, we can see it here. There's a, a the, only the distal end of a quarter mil straw and uh, the stainless steel casu gun. And this is what we would call the blue sheath with a stainless steel tip on it and with side ejection ports. And one would load the embryo into the, the straw. The straw would be placed down into the, the blue sheath and, and then the casu gun obviously put down the sheath. And then uh, this will hold embryos, uh, my suggestion is out to about a millimeter. The narrowest part in here is not the straw width, and it's not the width of that opening. It's the diameter going down through there, which is about 1,200, little over 1,200 microns. And so just because an embryo fits in here does not mean it's going to fit down through the lumen of that uh, stainless steel tip. So if the embryo gets bigger than a millimeter, we're going to use uh, an insemination pipette. And here you can see just the distal end of the insemination pipette. And anything that's bigger than this, most of them will fit in an insemination pipette. And there are programs that they transfer all embryos, big embryos and small embryos, uh, with just an insemination pipette and do, do it quite effectively. Now, there's another technique that's been described for a number of years now, and that's the Wilshire technique or using a, a um, a, a cervical forceps. So to do this, you would need a speculum. And, and then this is the set of forceps with a grasping end here. The upper part would be put in the, you can see the speculum here. We've got a pair of LED lights. These two are attached to the, uh, atta attached to the speculum and, and well illuminating the cranial vaginal vault. Again, the cervix here, dorsal frenulum. Uh, this, this, um, uh, device would be used to, the top part would be inserted into the external os, and the bottom part would be used to grasp the, the lower part, the ventral part of the external os, and you would pull that uh, caudally, or retract it caudally, and it will straighten out the cervix. Uh, those of you that do um, manual embryo transfer will, will understand that sometimes the cervix is straight. Other times there's a gentle curve to it, and other times there's almost an S shape curve to it, which can be problematic trying to pass a catheter through. And if you use the Wilshire forceps and retract the cervix caudally, you'll straighten up the cervix, and that makes the vis visual transfer of the of the um, casu gun or AI pipette through the external os, through the length of the cervical lumen and into the uterus, uh, uh, remarkably easy. And so many programs have transitioned from manual embryo transfer to using this um, cervical forceps technique. So one of the issues uh, on embryo transfer, failure of the embryo to exit the CASU gun. Dr. David Jasko at one of the AAEP meetings a number of years ago, uh, told the audience in a lecture that, that he had uh, flush the, the tip of the catheter, uh, the transfer pipette, the casugan, after transfer, and had seen an embryo that he thought should have been up in the recipient mare, still in the Petri dish, or it came out of here into the Petri dish. So after that meeting, uh, we started doing that in our program, and, and we saw the same thing. So uh, kudos to Dr. Uh, Jasko for telling us about that. And our rough data is about one in every 200 transfers the embryo will not leave the tip here. And you think for this very valuable embryo that you just transferred, it, it surely must be up in the uterus of that recipient mare, but it never exited the gun. 
And so we take it back into the lab. We put some more holding media through this into a Petri dish and look for the embryo. If the embryo is, is in the Petri dish and, and never left the gun, we'll, uh, we'll transfer it again right back into that same mare. There's a number of issues that come up in the actual physical transfer, and we'll just go through a couple of them here. I uh, can't pass the gun through the cervix with a manual standard technique. So one, one solution to that is stop that procedure and, and select a new recipient. An alternative would be that cervical forceps technique. And, and if you can extend that cervix, uh, pull it caudally, it'll straighten the cervix and almost always that pipette will slide right through. Another one is if you encounter a defect in the cervix, whether it's a laceration or an adhesion, um, my advice would be if it's a very small defect in the external loss of the cervix and it really doesn't go down into the much of the cervical, uh, the main part of the cervix, uh, you can use that same mare. But it's a, if it's a bigger cervical defect, laceration or, or adhesions, uh, stop the procedure and get a new recipient mare up. From a management standpoint, it would be good if you could evaluate the cervix at the beginning of the season. We'll do this because we do um, manage, monitor our recipient herd. We will culture and do a cytology in all the recipients early in the season. And so at that point, we'll be able to evaluate the cervix to make sure there's no, uh, no issues that we uh, otherwise would have missed. Once in a while, you get a mare that will strain during the transfer. And so just take a break for a moment, restrain the mare, probably sedate the mare. We might administer buscopan and get her to stop straining, give her a chance to calm down a little bit and then transfer the embryo. All right, this may be the most important slide for some of you. And that's what do you do if you don't have a cycling recipient, a, a mare that's having normal estrus cycle every 21 day cycles, and you, but you do have some non-cycling mares, these seasonally anestrous mares in North America, it may be, or the Northern Hemisphere, this may be in, uh, still in February, March, or maybe even April. But you've got non-cycling mares, they're nice mares, they're just not cycling. And so you've run out of your good ones. And then um, from a management, a little tongue in cheek here, you should acquire more. But if you don't, if you can't, then we're going to use hormone therapy on these non-cycling mares. And interestingly, based on, on others, uh, some of our work and others around the world, it's actually really convenient. The day the donor mares ovulate, you don't have to panic, but the donor mares ovulated, that day will give the recipient mare an intramuscular dose of estradiol, somewhere five to 10 milligrams. We'll do that once a day for two days. Then after two days on day three, we'll start uh, progesterone therapy. So they'll have estrogen for two days. That'll mi mimic the mare coming into heat. And then we'll start an artificial luteal phase, if you want to think about it like that, by injection of progesterone. We'll typically use injectable progesterone, a short-acting progesterone, give 200 milligrams in the muscle once a day. Alternatively to that, you can use a longer-acting progesterone that'll last way more than a week or oral altrinogest, uh, and the dose on that would be 10 mils of volume orally once a day. So we're giving her a phase where uh, she'll be exposed to estrogen and then progesterone, and we'll, we'll do this for about five or six days, at which point we'll flush the donor mare. If we get an embryo, we'll transfer it. We'll keep her on supplemental progesterone until we do a pregnancy diagnosis at 12 days and again at 16 days. We've done many of these now and our, our transfer success rate is virtually identical to that of a cycling mare. So we're, we're quite comfortable uh, with that therapy for non-cycling mares. Rarely, uh, but during the breeding season, rarely, uh, but we do encounter a situation where, where we don't have a cycling recipient or, or any non-cycling recipients available. And you have to have some type of almost an emergency uh, backup plan and so one backup plan that we've been um, kind of forced into occasionally is we'll pick up a, a recipient mare that's got a corpus luteum. The donor mare has ovulated and, and, um, and then we'll admit, so maybe we had a recipient lined up, but she has a bad cycle. She's got fluid in her uterus, a positive culture. We just can't use her. So we scramble to find a backup plan. So if we take a diestrous mare 
we give her a, a dose of prostaglandins, we'll use cloprostanol, estromate, 250 micrograms as an intramuscular injection, give her prostaglandins, start estradiol on the same day, give that for two days, and then start our progesterone therapy, and, and this will work. Uh, we're not happy to have to do that, but it will work, and you can get pregnant recipients out of that. So I'll finish up here. What do we expect for transfer success rates, the day 16 pregnancy rate in the recipient mare? We'd all love to be greater than 80% of mares that receive a grade one or grade two embryo of that mare being pregnant. Um, the, the lower values down in here, 60 to 70%. There's probably some things I'm going to suggest that it's likely uh, the recipient quality and recipient availability and there are ways to improve that up above 70 and, and one should shoot for uh, 80%. It's hard to achieve and be consistent with that. It's very hard to achieve a consistent greater than 90% transfer success rate in any larger embryo transfer program. So with that, uh, Dr. Palmer, I will turn the floor over to you to see if there's any questions on recipient mare management. Well, I'm glad to hear that you're asking for questions rather than turning the floor over to me to speak uh, on behalf of this topic. Uh, but yeah, there are a few questions. Um, so do you allow the donor or the owner of a donor mayor to provide their own recipient mayor? We, yes, the answer is yes. And somewhat begrudgingly sometimes because when we manage our own recipient herd, uh, we know all about those recipients. We know their history, their health generally. We're following them. We know when they, when they ovulate and if they've been a good mom before. But sometimes we'll be in a situation, and others will too, where we don't have enough of our own recipient mares for everybody that wants to do embryo transfer. And in those situations, if we're already booked solid, uh, we'll tell an owner, yeah, you can bring your donor mare to, to us, but you've got to bring one or two recipient mares with that. And so we'll work up their recipient mare, just like we would any other mare. We'll ultrasound the mare, do a culture. We'll talk to them about the reproductive history of that mare. Hopefully that mare is not older. And, and we're faced with that sometimes. They'll bring us a, a somewhat older recipient mare. And often I'll tell them, look, if you really want this to work, find a younger mare, rent it, borrow it, uh, whatever you need to do to find a younger mare. So the answer is yes. Um, uh, we... We did quite a few of those last year, and they're always a little more challenging in that you've got more moving parts and you've got more mares to, uh, to bring up individually as opposed to our mares, which we keep in, in fairly large herds. So yeah, we do owner recipients. Um, and I think a lot of people around the world are going to have to start doing that as well, just because of the lack of availability of recipient mares in general. All right, got another question for you here, um, and that is, what management do you give to recipients post-transfer? That's another good question, and various embryo transfer programs will have their own way of doing this. We typically will sedate the mare, and I just use a little bit of acepromazine to sedate the recipient mare. It just relaxes her, and it relaxes the cervix a little bit as well. Some people will use xylazine. It actually increases the uterine tone. But so generally we do sedate the recipient. We do uh, give a dose of flunixin megalamine, banamine, uh, as an antiprostaglandin, and, and then we'll, we'll do the transfer. Now, there are other programs that will give other medications at the time of transfer. Uh, uh, that's about all we do. We do put though, supplement the mare with progesterone after the transfer. And so we'll use oral altrinogest for that. A number of programs don't use supplemental progesterone and their pregnancy rates are, are quite good. And every year prior to the breeding season, we'll ask ourselves the same question. Do we need to keep using um, uh on these mares? And, and our thought process is on more than 90% of the mares, they don't need supplemental progesterone, but on the five, maybe 10% of the mares that, uh, that do, uh, they might lose their corpus luteum we're happy that we have them on supplemental progesterone, but clearly most uh, recipient mares don't need it. All right, we've got just a few more minutes here with a few more questions. 
Uh, at the time of transfer, do you administer medication to the recipient, such as progesterone or any antibiotics? And so I answer the question on progesterone. Uh, so we do put mares on, on oral altrinogest. Um, and, and some of the mares that we've used injectable progesterone on to give them a, a, um, a hormonal phase, well, we may keep them on injectable progesterone. So that's an alternative. And then in the days of regular embryo transfer, the standard embryo transfer, we would not use antibiotics. This last year, because it was our first year using the Wilshire technique, we chose to give a dose of, of uh, systemic antibiotics at the time of transfer, which I don't think is needed, but we did do it this year. Uh, we, may, we may discontinue that uh, next season. I think we've got just enough time for the last two questions here. Um, next is when using a maiden mare as a recipient, would you still culture before transferring or would you worry about perhaps causing more of an issue yeah. by accidentally introducing something? That's a fair question. Uh, obviously we're gonna culture the mare when she's in heat. Uh, and, and even on the maiden mares, they should have good cervical relaxation. It's an interesting, thought though that most maiden mares should have minimal contamination of their uterus. They should be clean as in not infected, but we've been doing this a long time. And it's interesting that some of these maiden mares, even if they don't have fluid in their uterus visible on ultrasound, that will something, some bacteria will grow on culture and it's usually gonna be streptococcus. So I, I get the question. I think it's a good question. Uh, we still do culture them, and, and, and once in a while, even on a maiden mare, we're glad we did because we caught something that if we were to have put an embryo in that mare and she has a, what would be a mild endometritis, uh, that pregnancy may not have stayed. All right, I'll uh, read this last one. Hopefully, I'll get it straight. But up to a thousand micron embryo uh, using a, you, a 0.25 mil straw per gun, greater than a thousand micron, a 0 0.5 straw per gun. What is the largest size that a 0 0.50 gun will handle? Right. Uh, I did measure that one year, just snipped off the end of it and put it under our microscope and use electronic calipers to measure that. And, and I don't know, and I don't want to be wrong. I don't know. Uh, but I, I, so I'll, I'll answer that with, I don't know. Uh, but we have had embryos come out that have been uh, clearly um, an, uh, an ovulation occurred before we thought it was going to. And we've got embryos, not commonly, that are two to three millimeters in size. And it, we've even had to use larger devices to transfer them as in the, the outer sheath of a, of a uterine culture instrument to pick up the embryo and transfer it. The interesting thing with those is immediately after transfer, you can ultrasound the recipient and you can see the embryo. So at that point, you, you could tell the owner, she's pregnant, we transferred the embryo and it's visible sitting right there. So good question. I don't know the answer of the diameter of the 0.5 mil straw. One of the ways I say that you can always recognize an expert in the field is their willingness to say, I don't know. Uh, so, I got plenty of that. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's what keeps us going. Hey, Pat, I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation this evening. I know I speak uh, on behalf of others when I say that your willingness to spend your time with us to share your expertise and experience is, is greatly appreciated. Um, you know, we've mentioned it, but, you know, there's obviously no way in our brief time together that we could convey and cover every detail of a very complex topic. And so uh, everybody do know that uh, Dr. McHugh has got a great online course on embryo transfer, as well as some other great e uh, equine repro courses uh, available at csuvetce.com. And the, the best way to navigate that if you're new to the site is uh, just go to the homepage for csuvetce.com and uh, navigate your way down the home page to let's find what you're looking for that seems appropriate and then click on the learning style and from that you would select online because you're looking for online learning um, and uh, if you go through that drop down menu it'll take you right there so uh, a special thank you as well this evening goes out to universal imaging and merck animal health for sponsoring this uh, very good and uh, interactive webinar episode. I want to thank all of you in the audience for joining us this evening. Next month, we'll have a special guest. That'll be Dr. Naomi Hoyer, 
who will be speaking about clinical dentistry case discussions, interpreting shades of gray. And she'll be presenting that on Wednesday, December 7th at 7 p.m. New York time. That's 5 p.m. here in the mountains, and we'll look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, do remember you're more than a learner. You're a whole person. Take care of yourself, and let's look out for each other. I want you all to have a great evening. <laughs>